Good morning, everyone. My name is Sophia Reinhardt, and you don't know me. I'm a senior studies double major in international science and English. In this class, I will commission into the U.S. Army, hopefully steering me towards the route of my future career in the United States. And also, good morning. I am also a senior studying political science. My name is James Culp. Uh, in 2025, in the spring, I'm going to be commissioning as a naval aviator. In 2022, Jankowitz was appointed to lead the Disinformation Governments Board, an intra-agency best practices and coordination entity at the Department of Homeland Security. She resigned the position after a sustained dis disinformation campaign caused by the Biden administration to abandon the project. From 2017 to 2022, Jankowitz also held fellowships at the Wilson Center, where she led accessible, actionable research about the efforts of disinformation on women, on women and freedom of expression around the world. She advised the Ukrainian Foreign Ministry on strategic communications under the support of Fulbright Clinton Public Policy Fellowship in 2016 to 2017. Early in her career, she managed democracy assistance programs in Russia and Belarus at the National Democratic Institute. For audience members, Ms. J after the presentation, Sophie and I will pose a couple of questions after the conversation. We'll open it up to you all, and the microphone's on the left and the right. Uh, please pose questions for her. Ms. Jankowitz, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Sophia. Thanks, James. Uh, and thank you to the organizers for having me here today. It's really a delight to be here. Um, on a personal note, it's also special for me to be here today. My, my dad was uh, an aerial reconnaissance officer in Vietnam, and uh, today is 14 years since he passed away as a result of his exposure to Agent Orange, which made him develop uh, multiple myeloma. So I know he'd be proud for me to be here today. I've, uh, I've always been very happy um, and honored to engage with our military at various levels at the National War College in D.C. and uh, testifying before the House Armed Services Committee. And this is yet another, uh, another thing that I'm proud to engage with. So thanks again for having me. Um, so just a little bit about myself. The, the students have introduced me, but uh, a little bit more color for you. Um, I've done a lot of different things in my career. And on the drive over here, uh, one of the cadets was asking me, you know, what, what can I do to make my career a little bit look like yours? Uh, and my, my response was, don't say no to things, right? Uh, keep your, your experiences, your eyes open. Um, try to be open to new experiences. And you don't know where life is going to take you. Uh, I started my career working on democracy assistance programs to Russia and Belarus. I actually went to the same graduate school uh, that the Lieutenant General did at Georgetown, the School of Foreign Service, and studied Russian and East European studies there, and found myself uh, administering programs to Russia and Belarus at a time when democracy assistance to Central and Eastern Europe wasn't something that was really on vogue. I actually had a lot of my classmates tell me, well, Russia, Russia's not a threat anymore. It's not the Cold War in, anymore. Why are you studying this? Why are you working on this? And that year that I was graduating was actually the year that uh, Russia kind of asked USAID, the US Agency for International Development, to leave Russia. And we started to see this steep decline in US-Russian relations that has kind of led us to where we are today. So uh, joke's on them. Um, but uh, from there, I, I went and I, I did a Fulbright in Ukraine. I was very happy to be advising the Ukrainian Foreign Ministry in what was then the third year of a war that's now been going on for more than 10. Uh, and at that time, there was already Ukraine fatigue happening among the international community. My colleagues in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs were, were fighting Russian disinformation every day on the ground. And at the same time, we saw the United States kind of waking up to the threat of Russian information warfare after our 2016 election. 
Uh, I've worked in nonprofits and in the government, in the tech spheres. I've spent time across the region. And now I lead a new nonprofit, and my bio was not up to date, so that's on me, uh, that is focused on exposing deceptive inter information practices here in the United States, whether they're coming from foreign or domestic sources. And so with that in mind, I thought today I would give you a little bit of an information roadmap of where we've been, where we are, where we're going, and, and how we got to where we are today. So uh, Sophia and James told me that uh, you guys would appreciate a, a GIF. Oop, I've got to use the clicker here. Maybe. Have I messed something up now? I think I ruined everything. It's not advancing. Uh, let me see. Resume slideshow. Let's see if that does it. There we go. There's the GIF. All right, a cat. Um, why am I showing you a picture of a cat? It is because, in my opinion, and the Lieutenant General alluded to this, we have, uh, this, is, this is basically what the U.S. response to information warfare has looked like. We have been playing whack-a-troll for the past eight years. We've been trying to remove content from the internet. We've been trying to suppress certain content. We want to point out what's Russian trolls and what's not, right? It's not a very effective or joined up response. And I think we need to move not only toward a whole of government response, but a whole of society response. Um, and that's what we'll be talking about today. As I said, these are the questions that I hope to answer for you. And I thought we'd start just by setting some ground definitions, because I hear still to this day, uh, you know, preeminent journalists, members of Congress, even sometimes uh, heads of state, misusing these terms. So let's talk about what they are. Disinformation, the way I define it, and I think the agreed upon definition for uh, most scholars, is false or misleading information that's shared with malign intent, right? That's our adversaries using false information to undermine our democracies. That is folks who are hawking miracle cures on the internet uh, or, or selling kind of faulty goods. Um, the folks who are engaging in clickbait, they're also engaging in disinformation, right? But that's different than misinformation. And here we are in uh, October. Next month is Thanksgiving. We're all going to be returning home to our families, hopefully avoiding some of the sticky political conversations that we hope to avoid. But we've all got that one relative, right, who loves to traffic in conspiracy theories, Crazy Aunt Sally or Uncle Bob. And that's misinformation. They're not necessarily doing that with any malign intent. They just want to share what they've seen or read on the internet because they think it might be interesting to you or helpful to you. They're not trying to take over the world or anything like that. And that's a bit different than propaganda. Propaganda is false or misleading information that has a political purpose behind it, um, that is advancing a particular political worldview. A little bit different than disinformation. Uh, if we look at some of the campaigns that we've already heard about today, Russia has often been on both sides of the same issue. It's not necessarily always pushing the Russian worldview or saying Russia is great. Uh, conversely, we've got China that engages in propaganda quite deliberately. Uh, if you look at the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, China was pushing a very pro-China narrative at that time, sending PPE, sending ventilators, et cetera. Um, that, that falls under the idea of propaganda. What Russia's doing today is rarely propaganda. Sometimes it is, but it's mostly disinformation. So back in 2016, uh, we are all familiar with, with what happened, so I'm not going to go into a great amount of detail, but I am going to highlight a couple of things that are important. You know, during the presidential, vice presidential debate a couple of days ago, we heard uh, vice presidential candidate Vance, Senator Vance, mention uh, Russian ads. Uh, Russia bought five, uh, not $500,000, as he said, but $100,000 in ads on Facebook. This was the big story back then, right? Russia's buying ads in rubles. How could Facebook allow this to happen? Uh, if you look at that ad archive, which I encourage you to do, and I have my graduate students do at Syracuse, uh, you can see that most of those ads weren't particularly effective. And so you might hear people say, well, Russian disinformation in 2016 actually wasn't effective. But what was effective was the hack and leak operation that happened. Uh, if you don't know, or if you were perhaps in middle school at that time, as some of the younger folks among the audience might have been, uh, what happened was the, the Democratic campaign was hacked by Russian intelligence services, who then leaked private documents to the, for the world to see. And they did this during the month of October, the October surprise, right? 
That was much more effective than any Russian ad that the government could have bought because it changed how the candidates talked about each other, it changed how the media, media talked about the campaigns, and it changed what was uh, going on in voters' heads as they headed toward the, the voting booth in November. Now, can we say definitively that Russian disinformation changed votes? No, but we can say that it changed the discourse, and I think that's very important. And I think anybody who cares about our democratic infrastructure, about elections should be really worried that uh, still to this day we've got Russian, Chinese, Iranian hackers attempting to hack the campaigns, leak documents, embarrass candidates, embarrass campaigns. That should be the domain of the American media and American voters only. So that's one thing that was going on. We also saw an embrace of domestic disinformation, mostly coming from, at that time, candidate Trump. I don't have to go through uh, what, was, what was going on back then. Uh, we've seen some of it since then. We've seen the undermining of our electoral processes as well. But I would say, far from you know, typical politicians, uh, perhaps twisting statistics, omitting context, we had a deliberate engagement with lies that we had never had before. And this is important, particularly in the context of Russian disinformation, because Russia's not often making things up whole cloth. They are seizing on fissures in our society, pre-existing fissures, that they can amplify and push forward in order to under undermine our democracies. I also want to note there were disinformation for profit operations going on. So there was a little town, there still is a little town called Velesh in Macedonia, where a bunch of teenagers figured out if they created clickbait articles about Hillary Clinton, denigrating her, you know, talking about how she was horrible, trafficking in rumors, what have you, and then monetized that site with Google Ads, they could make lots and lots of money. And indeed, they did. They made over a million dollars and were driving around their little uh, town in Mercedes Benzes. Uh, this industry has expanded exploded since 2016. There are no real uh, checks or balances or regulations on what people can say on the internet and then monetize with services like Google Ads. And uh, this is another kind of darker side. It's not a nation state that's engaging in this behavior, but there are people who are just trying to, you know, separate us to divide us for money, for monetary gain. It's got a... Nope, okay. Something is happening here. I'll sing for you while we figure it out. Uh, it appears to be frozen, tech folks. So I'm not sure. Resume slideshow again. Let's see what's going on. And nope, still cannot advance. I will continue without the slides. Um, now, what the difference between what was going on in 2016 and what's happening now in 2020 is that we have a diversity of actors. I will move aside and keep talking here. Um, we have a diversity of actors. Where Russia was the primary uh, foreign entity on the scene back then, we now have Iran participating, just a hack and leak recently, uh, targeting the Trump campaign that was quite widely reported on. Um, we've heard about Spamiflage Dragon, which is one of the Chinese operations putting out disinformation. Uh, there's, there's those big three. But then we've also got, thank you, there we go. Um, we've got savvier foreign actors. We've got domestic political extremists. We've got disinformation for profit that has exploded, as I've just mentioned. But we also have a diversity of platforms. It's not just about Twitter and Facebook anymore. Uh, in fact, because of Elon Musk taking over Twitter, we now have folks who are really spread out around the internet, not on Twitter necessarily anymore. In 2016, TikTok didn't exist. Uh, we've got folks on TikTok and disinformation being driven there, claims that the Chinese government uh, is able to affect what we're seeing on our feeds because they own that proprietary technology and are pushing different things out through the algorithm there. And we've also got a diversity of tactics. It's not just about ads and hack and leaks anymore. We're seeing information laundering when uh, individuals introduce narratives to domestic entities. We actually have seen this a lot with Ukraine fatigue where uh, members of Congress mention 
uh, certain grievances that only, only the Russian government has brought up in Ukraine, and suddenly they're being aired in the halls of Congress, like the language rights of Hungarians in Transcarpathia. This was something that members of Congress brought up uh, in order to undermine Ukraine aid recently. And we're seeing, of course, artificial intelligence powered disinfo and closed groups. So channels, uh, platforms like Telegram, Facebook groups, other closed entities where people can exchange information. It's a trusted community. There's not a lot of visibility into what's going on there. We're seeing foreign actors as well as domestic actors engaging in that sort of disinformation in those groups. And we don't have a ton of visibility there. Now, we got here through kind of a murky situation, and some of this was alluded to in the wonderful video we saw opening the conference. Uh, unfortunately, from 2016 onward, the idea of Russian interference has been politicized. We have seen an acute reaction from both sides of the political spectrum. On, on the right, uh, we've seen the, the kind of undermining that this even happened. Uh, believe me, if I mention Russia among certain groups in Washington, D.C., I will be shouted out of the room because they don't want to talk about the fact that Russia was and continues to interfere in our political processes for foreign policy gain. But we also saw perhaps an overcorrection from the left who were eager to blame Hillary Clinton's 2016 loss entirely on Russia, and I think there were a lot of factors that went into that, and we don't need to litigate that today. But as a result, this issue has become extremely politicized. COVID really entrenched that. We saw widespread false narratives, mistrust, conspiracy theories that people were leaning on because it was a confusing and scary time and conspiracy theories offer a, a way for people to navigate today's information environment uh, that is simpler, right? That, that uh, provides them community, that provides an explanation for things that are difficult that we're all dealing with. And then from 2020 to today, of course, we had the Stop the Steal movement, this normalization of disinformation and distrust in the government, claiming that our political processes, our infrastructure uh, of democracy is not safe anymore. When we've heard our intelligence, agency, uh, intelligence agencies, our cybersecurity and infrastructure security agencies say that the elections that we've held since 2016 have been progressively more and more secure. Right? Uh, we know that foreign entities are trying to affect the vote. They're not able to do that. They are certainly engaging in information warfare and influence operations, uh, and we are doing our best to dispel those things. But to say that our vote is not secure uh, is, is something that, uh, unfortunately, uh, plays into the hand of those that want to weaponize pre-existing fissures for their benefit. This is a, a report that comes out every two years from the Office of the Director of National Intelligence that I encourage you all to read. Um, it is a bulletin about election threats that have been ongoing, and there's been one, I think, every year since 20, every uh, biannually since 2018. Um, this is a really interesting document, came out at the end of last year, that was looking at our midterm elections in 2022. And again, that diversity of actors is something I want you to remember. So uh, what it says is that China attempted to influence a handful of midterm races across political parties where it deemed that uh, a certain outcome might be positive for U.S.-China relations or U.S.-China policy. Iran continued to attempt to exploit social divisions and undermine confidence in our democratic institutions. You might remember in 2020, Iran targeted democratic voters in a handful of swing states, um, pretending to be uh, individuals from the Proud Boys, the militia group, saying that they would be intimidated at the polls if they went out to vote. That operation was very roundly dismissed by the IC, DHS, uh, and the FBI in 2020 um, in a coordinated effort that I'll get back to later. But Iran continues to do this sort of stuff and did it in the 2022 elections. Russia was very specifically attempting to undermine the Democratic Party and especially confidence uh, in the election in order to undermine support for Ukraine. So again, 2022, our midterms happened just a few months after the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, and that campaign to undermine confidence in Ukraine aid, undermine support for Ukraine, continues today. And what's very interesting to me, although it's redacted across the report, is that the IC assessed that Cuba and other smaller nations were also learning from the playbook that the Russians and others had put forward before them. So we've got uh, a, a real diversity of actors as we head toward 2024. 
Uh, now, we are just less than 30 days before the election, and here's what we've got going on already from the key uh, axis of foreign interference campaigns. We have Russia, which has engaged in the doppelganger operation. Have any of you heard of doppelganger? One person. All right, let me explain for you. Way to go. Uh, so Doppelganger is an ongoing years-long operation that Russia has engaged in in order to mimic real news sites in our, uh, our country. So it might be a site that looks exactly like the Washington Post, for instance, but instead of WashingtonPost.com, it'll be WashingtonPost.co, and when someone navigates there, they get a site that, again, really looks like the Washington Post, but actually... Uh, when you look at the content, sometimes is AI-generated content, it's very divisive content, it puts forward a Russian worldview or uh, undermines kind of support for key concepts, key initiatives like Ukraine aid, for instance. Um, there have been a number of takedowns that the Department of Justice has done. They've seized uh, domains that have been bought using uh, web servers here in the United States. They're, they're stationed there. Um, they've been able to undermine that operation, but it continues, right? Again, playing whack a troll in a little bit of a, a way. Um, we have the copy cop operation, which is another interesting one. A former sheriff from Florida sought asylum in Russia, and he uh, seems to be now working hand in hand, if not directly for the Russian government, in order to, again, populate sites that look like local news sites. So rather than the Washington Post, it might be the Northfield Times or something like that. You might stumble upon it using a Facebook ad or a search. And again, what you find there is often AI-generated content. He's using chatbots like ChatGPT to populate news articles that are compelling, salacious, divisive, uh, and meant to divide people. There was also an AI-enhanced bot farm that RT was using, Russia Today, the Russian propaganda network, in order to push Russian narratives on social media. This is a bit different from the bots of yesteryear because rather than just a Twitter egg and a string of letters and numbers, what we have is real seeming accounts that have an AI-generated avatar, uh, they've got a real name, they've got an identity because you can engage with ChatGPT or other LLMs this way to create these identities, and they use uh, AI in order to pump out content on different schedules, so an AI-enhanced bot farm. And then most recently, uh, just a few weeks ago as a matter of fact, we had a huge uh, indictment come down from the DOJ saying that uh, RT had paid $10 million to a company called Tenet Media out of Tennessee, which was set up expressly to funnel that money to a bunch of conservative YouTubers who were spreading divisive content online. Now, there was no direct, it seems like there was no direct editorial connection between RT and those YouTubers, but Russia wanted to invest in the content that they were making to continue to push divisions in our society. It's a pretty shocking, uh, shocking turn of events, and $10 million is a far cry from the $100,000 in ads that Russia purchased back in 2016. I've already mentioned Iran's hack and leak of the Trump campaign, uh, also an attempted hack of the Harris and previously Biden campaigns. Um, the idea there is the same as what Russia engaged in in 2016, try to identify uh, you know, embarrassing documents that they might share with, uh, with media organizations. So far, our media has been quite circumspect, and many journalists have passed on publishing these documents because it has been widely reported that they're coming from Iran. Um, so I think that's quite an interesting development. And then uh, China, we've seen a number of things. I mentioned Spamouflage Dragon. Again, that's a wide, uh, widespread bot network that's engaged in a number of democracies. But we also see in that network and others troll accounts that are impersonating Trump supporters uh, in order, again, to give the guise of grassroots to support to some of the divisive narratives that these countries are interested in. Now, uh, in, back in 2020, I wrote a paper for Parameters, the uh, U.S. Army War College's uh, journal, which you can all look at, called Enduring Information Vigilance, uh, How to Respond to Disinformation After COVID-19. And I wrote this with a colleague of mine who is a uh, U.K. Army Reserve officer um, looking at kind of the transatlantic response to disinformation and what we needed to do to wake up to the persistent threat that we were at that moment experiencing in 2020. And I encourage you to read the paper. It's not too dense. 
Um, but I'll give you the top lines here for a second. We assessed that nations like China, Russia, and Iran are engaged in what we called perpetual information competition. And you heard this from the Lieutenant General earlier today. These hostile states are engaged in this competition because they recognize it's the new normal. Uh, there is very low cost to entry and high reward if they get it right, right? They're constantly probing for new vulnerabilities in our societies, whether those are issues around race, Race, gun control, abortion, et cetera. Um, I will note that once uh, Vice President Harris entered the, the race for president, immediately Russia went after her with gendered and racist rhetoric. So again, another, another vulnerability they were probing. They are using all channels, channels available to them, not government and non-government, online and offline, in order to influence our societies. Uh, they are not concerned about whether something is the portfolio of one department and they're going to be stepping on toes and turf. No, they just go for it. They throw spaghetti at the wall and they see what sticks. Uh, this doesn't in adhere neatly to our international boundaries. I think we still... Um, try to think about information warfare as something that, okay, it's happening over there, and I know this is a particular challenge, right, for the military because uh, your domain is, is abroad, not here at home, but we need to think of this as uh, understanding that Russia, Iran, China, others aren't, you know, looking neatly at the, the difference between domestic and uh, foreign disinformation and, in fact, are exploiting that. So understanding what perpetual information competition looks like for our adversaries, my colleague and I uh, came up with this concept of enduring information vigilance. So what do we need to do, not only in the military, but in our whole of government response to disinformation uh, in order to meet this challenge? First of all, we need to improve our capabilities. And this is one of the things that you're all doing here today at this conference and in your studies at Norwich. Uh, this is important to invest in the building of an understanding that this is an enduring threat beyond discrete campaigns. We're often finding ourselves on the back foot reacting to adversarial information warfare. We need to advance awareness and understanding of these campaigns and also the tools, right? Um, and I know you're all doing that here, so you, you're off to a great start. We need to coordinate. I was so gratified to hear the Lieutenant General mention uh, the Department of Education, right? I used to get laughed out of the room when I'd be at national security and foreign policy events in here and in Europe uh, saying, okay, we've got a lot of security folks in the room. Where's, where's the Ministry of Culture if we were in another country? Where's the Department of Education? Where's the Department of Health and Human Services? These are all vectors along which our adversaries are certainly targeting us. How are we responding and coordinating with folks that you might not otherwise otherwise see uh, in your day-to-day -day work. Um, this is not a security issue anymore, and we need to get out of that securitized thinking if we're going to meet the moment. We also need to cooperate internationally, and this is somewhere where I think the United States has done a pretty decent job. Uh, we've coordinated with our Five Eyes partners. We've coordinated uh, amongst G7 countries. There's a rapid response mechanism that identifies and responds to disinformation coming from adversarial nations. We did a good job with that with Ukraine. Uh, but there's always room for improvement in efficiency, in sharing joint analysis, communications, uh, declassification efforts, which I could talk for an hour on. Those were extremely effective ahead of the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, um, and also joint commissions. Now, we've had a huge rollback in the private sector that I would be remiss not to mention. Uh, those of you who are doing research on disinformation, uh, perhaps you noticed, perhaps you didn't, because uh, you haven't been in this field as, as, as long as I have, and I've got some of the gray hairs to prove it. Um, we used to have much more data access to what was going on on platforms for the past eight years. Uh, the platforms became more and more circumspect about that, in part because some people were using that data for ill to target folks in ways that uh, didn't respect their privacy, right? But what we've seen in the past couple of, I would say about a year, is the monetization and complete uh, cutoff of data access for researchers, journalists, et cetera, to these platforms. Elon Musk is now charging $40,000 a month to access Twitter's application programming interface, or API. This is the way that we communicate with the platform to scrape large amounts of data and uh, analyze what's going on there. 
Facebook has shut down CrowdTangle, which was the service that we used to analyze data on Facebook. They've replaced it with something called the Meta Content Library, but most researchers agree it is not a suitable replacement. Even Reddit has shut down their API, and Reddit is the front page of the internet. Russia also has launched campaigns on Reddit. Uh, and so we're kind of in the dark about what's going on on social media platforms as we head toward the election. And that's pretty scary. I've done studies uh, over the past couple of years that I would not now be able to replicate because I no longer have access to that data. Uh, this is intentional, right? These people who have multi-billion dollar platforms and are making money off of us, the customers, the users of those platforms, uh, they don't want that scrutiny about what they're doing online anymore. And I think that's a huge problem and that's something for our legislators to solve. Uh, this is a picture of me on my way to testify before the uh, House Judiciary Subcommittee on the Weaponization of Government. So Sophia and James mentioned in my bio that I served briefly as the Executive Director of the Department of Homeland Security's Disinformation Governance Board. This was an entity that was meant to do that coordination that I talked about a couple minutes ago. It was meant to bring together all the disparate parts of DHS, which is a bit of a Frankenstein of a government agency. You've got everything from the Coast Guard, the Secret Service, uh, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, FEMA, uh, Customs and Border Protection, all under one roof. Um, metaphorically speaking, there are actually multiple different buildings. But uh, my job was to bring all of those folks together and say, what are you doing to respond to disinformation in your portfolio? And how can we make sure that we're sharing best practices? How can we make sure that we are keeping the bumpers on the bowling alley of civil rights, civil liberty, and privacy, protecting those rights that we hold so dear as Americans? When this effort was announced, Folks on both sides of the spectrum claimed that it was going to be a ministry of truth and that I was going to be censoring people. Uh, this is pretty laughable because my, my grandfather was actually in a Russian gulag, so I, I'm quite vehemently opposed to censorship. And none of my work had actually focused on anything about removing content. That whack a troll metaphor, I've been using that for eight years, right? I am not in favor of that, I don't think it's effective. Um, but that was the salacious narrative of the day, and as a result, I got death threats. I was pregnant at the time. People were threatening my unborn child. Uh, my, my family was doxxed. My in-laws, my mother received uh, harassment and abuse. And to this day, just yesterday, I got um, a message like that on my phone on the way here uh, from people who, who wish me harm. I bring this up because, not just because this is a cool picture of me, and if you ever have to testify before Congress, I suggest you tip off a photographer so you can get a similar <laughs> picture of you on the way in. Um, but it's because this was the vanguard of, of a wave of attacks against disinformation researchers that continue to this day. Uh, there's an institute out at Stanford, the Stanford Internet Observatory, that had to basically be shut down because of lawsuits and attacks on the people who were doing work there to protect our information environment. There have been extraneous Freedom of Information Act requests at public universities that have buried researchers under paperwork in order to keep them from doing their work. And I'm not the only one, I'm far from the only one who has received these sorts of threats. And so I'm trying to paint a picture for you here that the government quite, didn't quite know what to do about this. I ended up resigning because it was clear that they weren't going to defend the work um, and they weren't really defending me. And I had a baby on the way and I didn't want to endanger him. Uh, research institutions don't know what to do about this. And at the same time, we have less access to data than we had before. So the folks who have been the canaries in the coal mine, who have been identifying these operations, uh, that not only foreign governments, but folks domestically are engaging in as well for power and for profit, they are hobbled. I think there is um, a collective commitment to keep doing the work, and that's why I, I started my new nonprofit a couple of months ago, but it's very, very difficult, um, and it comes at a great expense. And uh, I just want to make sure that everybody knows about that, because I'm not the only one who's been hauled into Congress. I was the first to get a subpoena from that committee. But plenty of us have been dealing with this McCarthyist inquisition over the past two years, and it is endangering our national security to politicize an issue like this at such a critical time. 
And we also have this advent of artificial intelligence, this accessibility of a new technology um, show, showcased so brilliantly in the opening video of this very conference. But just since January, we have seen, of course, uh, close to home here in Vermont, over in New Hampshire during the primary, the robocall impersonating President Biden that told voters to stay home. We've had uh, deep fake pornography against Taylor Swift, and not only Taylor Swift, I have also been a victim of deep fake pornography, and I always say when I'm speaking to military audiences, this is something that Russia has in its back pocket to undermine the chain of command uh, when you've got female officers who are, uh, you know, in important positions around the world. A great way to destabilize any unit would be to unleash deep fake pornography, and they've done this in countries like Georgia and Ukraine. Uh, Elon Musk, of course, shared a deep fake of a Kamala Harris campaign ad, and uh, my friends over at the Center for Countering Digital Hate have found that even though AI companies commit to not allowing their technologies to be used for electioneering, you can generate all sorts of fake images of both candidates that are photorealistic, that are pretty convincing, that might, in a time of, uh, you know, tumult, confuse people and lead them astray. In fact, we just saw this with Hurricane Helene. How many of you saw the AI-generated photo of the little girl and a puppy being evacuated uh, on, uh, yeah, a couple people, right, on a raft? Um, that one wasn't that convincing, in my opinion, but people online are still following for, falling for it, saying, oh, I hope this photo wins the, the Pulitzer Prize. It was generated by AI. So we are in a situation where we've, we've got a technology that doesn't have very many uh, guardrails on it, and uh, if I were Russia, if I were China, if I were Iran, I would be waiting for the next couple of weeks or the crucial transition period between November and January um, when things are kind of uh, tumultuous to unleash something like that and instill doubt and disarray in our democratic system. So this is how I'm feeling right now, uh, less than 30, 30 days before the election. And, you know, I say that in a little bit of a cheeky way. Obviously, I'm still doing this work. I am committed to it. It is gratifying to see so many of you here uh, committed to this work, interested in this work. And I do want to remind you all, as, as we head into the next couple of weeks, um, that we are all on the front lines of the information war, right? This isn't only about what our government can do, and I've outlined some strategies for, for ways that we can improve. There's, there's a lot to be done there. But we all play a role in whether something goes viral or not, right? So think before you share. Uh, this is a diagram from my friend Michael Caulfield at the University of Washington, and it's a really useful mnemonic for the the things that you should engage in, the practices that you should engage in when you, when you identify a piece of content that you're not sure about online, right? We all know when we get an email from the Nigerian prince offering us a million dollars that that's not real. We need to cultivate that same sort of sentiment and response when we're engaging with content online. So the first thing you do if you feel yourself getting emotional, because emotional manipulation is one of the preeminent ways that disinformers uh, push their content, stop. Put your phone down. I know you guys like to say, go touch grass, right? Go touch grass. <laughs> Get outside. Uh, if you're still thinking about that content in a couple, of, uh, couple minutes, come back inside. Investigate the source. See if they are typically sharing similarly salacious content or divisive content. See if there's other coverage. I don't love that this infographic says better coverage. What's better, what's worse? See if there's other coverage, right? Can you find anybody else reporting on what you're reading? And then. I know a lot of you are working in open source forensics. Trace those claims. See if you can find the uh, initial instance of that picture of the girl with the dog. Uh, see if it's been misattributed. This is a favorite tactic of Russian disinformers, right? Uh, do a reverse Google image search. See what you can find. This takes less than five minutes. But if we're all engaging in that more um, uh, deliberate engagement with our social media feeds, we can, we can slow the spread of some of these most viral claims that are going, uh, going around in the next couple of weeks. Think about context with AI. Um, there's this thing called the liar's dividend uh, that we've seen, in, <laughs> frankly, in play a couple times already this, this election season, where because, we, because AI has become so accessible, so pervasive, uh, folks that lie frequently can say, oh, that's just AI. Or, you know, um, my opponent has generated a, an, an AI crowd to make it seem like they are more successful than they actually are. 
Uh, think about that context. In the case of the robocall with New Hampshire and, and Biden, right, would the president really be telling people not to go out and vote? It seems a little bit far-fetched to me. So think about that context before you're sharing. And then most importantly, support and practice civility. I would expect no less from all of you here at Norwich, but unfortunately some people do forget that there's a human behind the screen. And I, uh, I've experienced a lot of that. One thing that I'll note is that when I, uh, when I do write back, usually to, to older men who have like pictures of their grandchildren in their profile pictures, and I say, hey, you know, my son's the same age as, as your grandson there, and I see you served in Vietnam, so did my dad. Uh, without fail, these folks tend to have pretty bad um, security for their profiles, so I can see all of these things. Um, you know, I find common ground with them, and I say, I'm sorry that, you know, you, you, uh, you've been lied to about my work, but here's, here's what I'm after, and, you know, I'm here to make America stronger, I'm here to make us more resilient, and, and here to protect our democracy, and I find that they do tend to walk things back after that. So just remember that civility uh, during these heady next couple of months, um, and just engage deliberately. I think that's the best thing that any of us can do in an age where we are passively fed so much information. Uh, this is where you can find me online. Uh, those are my two books. I think Sophia and James have read them, so uh, now they're going to give me some questions. I'm happy to take yours as well. Um, thank you so much for your time. So in How to Lose the Information War, Ms. Jenkins truly offers an urgent examination of the growing th threat of online disinformation, particularly Russia's campaigns that have destabilized Western democracies. Drawing from her work with Central and Eastern European governments on the front lines of this conflict, you truly shed light on how Western responses have continuously fallen short over the past few years. And the stakes now couldn't be higher. Truth, civil discourse, and the future of democracy are all on the line for us. And uh, we just have one question that we're gonna ask and then we're gonna open up the floor for any cadets or uh, participants to ask a question. But we'd love to dive deeper into your experiences, especially here at Norwich University, as you can look out into the crowd. So many of our students are headed into the government sector. What key lessons from your research on Russia's information tactics should be integrated into military training to prepare all of our officers or those going into the United States government for future conflicts? Yeah, that's a great question. And when I testified before the House Armed Services Committee in 2022, uh, or 2021, I guess, geez, pandemic time, I don't know what year anything was. Um, one of the things that I noted is that we uh, are lucky that you know we've got such a great, uh, strong military, and I've always been so impressed with all the audiences that I've spoken with in, in military audiences. We also have um, a great civilian workforce in DOD, uh, the, the largest uh, government department, and all of those folks, especially those who are deployed, have their families with them too, right? And when you think about this network of individuals that are out there, I think this is a great potential training ground for uh, a broad information li literacy curriculum. This is the sort of thing that DOD does really well. And if I had to say one recommendation for uh, every, um, every enlisted person and every civilian working in a military context, um, it's that we all need basic information literacy training. Uh, you know, it's not only Arlington County, Virginia that doesn't have information literacy in high schools. Um, I think a lot of voting age adults do not have the skills necessary to engage with information deliberately. Um, frankly, I, I think I mentioned I teach uh, graduate students at Syracuse. These are smart public policy master's students, some of whom are in mid-career um, and coming back to get a master's. And you know, I, I, one of the assignments I give them, and I encourage you to try it out, is to track your news and information consumption for 24 hours, and they are shocked at the amount of information that just comes to them passively. Scrolling TikTok or Instagram, stuff that is uh, coming through with a news alert. Um, we all need to get better at monitoring that and doing that kind of self-reflection. I think that's the first step. Um, and then when we talk about information literacy, it's not saying this, this outlet is good and this out outlet is bad. It's basic skills like the ones that I just talked about, the SIFT method, that um, allow you to assess a source very quickly, giving folks heuristics for how to do that, um, and, and not overwhelming them, and also educating them about the fact that when you're using social media, uh, you, you are the, 
the product, right? That's what's being sold. Your data is being sold. So understanding why when I'm searching for a new pair of shoes, I immediately start getting Instagram ads about those shoes. And then sometimes, unfortunately, I buy those shoes, right? Even I am infallible. Um, but I, even I am fallible in that way. Um, but at least going into it with a little bit more of that context is so, so important. And I think, um, again, the, the DOD structure really offers a way um, for that to go forward. And then beyond that, I mean, the coordination aspect is so, so important. Um, some of you might end up at, at embassies uh, around the world. You know, I encourage you in positions like that or, or working as kind of uh, alongside diplomats, I encourage you to make sure you're reaching out to those folks who, who are the cultural officers and attaches, who are working with the press, um, to get that holistic view of whatever country context or cultural context you're in. Uh, because as we've heard already today, that is so important for understanding your adversary and to developing a response that's not just wholly reactive, but is more proactive. Thank you. We'd like to open up the floor now to any students or audience members who'd like to ask questions. You can step straight up to the mic and we'll signal you when we're ready. You can start on our right side here. Good afternoon, ma'am. My name is Sebastian Mejia Lopez. I'm a political science major and studies war and peace. America has a pretty clear stance on uh, free speech and also having basically an informed cit citizenry through basically means of the tr following the truth. What would you say would be the best approach the United States should follow with regards to let's say our adversaries, clear example being China, with how essentially they're uh, using information warfare in terms of having their cybersecurity and censorship interwoven as basically being the same thing. What would you say the United States should essentially do to address these issues? Yeah, that's a great question, and it, um, it deals with one of the stickiest issues of responding to information warfare, which is that uh, Russia especially, but increasingly China and Iran, are playing right on that edge of what is foreign and what is domestic. And of course, we do not want to censor domestic speech. I think the most important thing, and the thing that we've lost, because the platforms have kind of pulled back from cooperation, they've pulled back from data access, is that we don't have oversight and transparency over the social media platforms. If there were one thing that I would hope for Congress to do, it would be increasing that oversight and transparency, not so that somebody in the government can decide what's true or false online, no. But the, so we have a clearinghouse of information and we recognize, okay, here's what's happening on these platforms. We can see, for instance, that uh, there are Russian-backed accounts that are influencing uh, certain parts of the electorate or Chinese, et cetera. We can ask the platforms and see what their response is. What are you doing to protect this election coming up, and they can't just grade their own homework because that's what's happening right now, right? Um, so that oversight and transparency is really important um, to whatever parts of the conversation come next. And there are other countries that have different legislative frameworks for how to deal with this issue. Um, in Europe, the Digital Services Act has just come into play last May. Um, still a bit early to say how that's gonna govern uh, the, the kind of truth and falsehoods online, but what it does do is allow researcher access. And I think that it, that preserves that openness, that free expression that we wanna keep, while um, hoping that the platforms are doing their due diligence as these public squares that we now rely on to, to keep us safe from all of that stuff. And frankly, we need more public-private cooperation as well in that way. Um, does that answer your question? More or less. Thank okay, you. thank you. Thank you for your work on behalf of uh, citizens who value the truth and our democracy. Um, I have a question relating to the social media APIs that you mentioned. So they're being monetized, and I think part of the reason for that is that the content on those APIs is extremely valuable for training large language models. And um, as long as it's free, then large language models can be trained on those that content. Um, but my question is, um, how can we track freedom of speech and hate speech, like different metrics across different social media platforms. How can we track that stuff when the APIs are locked down and what kind of techniques, like technical techniques can be used um, for that? 
Yeah, um, this is a hard one. So as I mentioned, one of the studies that I did in 2020 is not replicable today, and that one looked particularly at gendered hate speech, abuse, and disinformation against women in politics, used not only by uh, domestic uh, actors, but by Russia, China, and Iran as well. Um, that study, again, I wouldn't be able to do because all of the platforms that we use to gather that data are now unavailable unless I suddenly came into $40,000 a month to, to get access to uh, Elon's API. Um, and I think you're right, by the way. I think you know it's not only um, the AI insights that those, those platforms provide, but they also, uh, frankly, provide um, a lot of data for competitors, and they're not interested in giving that away for free either. Um, so in order to do that stuff today, I think the best way to do it is sampling. Um, and you are still able to get um, small amounts of data. So generally what I've been doing is developing a list of keywords, um, searching across platforms, and then uh, like gathering a thousand posts and assuming that that is going to be somewhat st statistically significant. It's not the best stand-in. When, um, when we did uh, the, the 2020 study, we gathered 336,000 pieces of data. So that, of course, was much more robust. Um, but we need a legislative solution to that, just like Europe has uh, engineered for, for researchers over there. And I'm hoping we'll see the same thing in the United States um, in the coming years. Thank you. Thank you. And we're all out of time, but thank you all for attending this insightful panel. And thank you, of course, for inspiring the next generation of leaders right in front of you. If you have any further questions, feel free to come to the front of the stage. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.